Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm, of course, sad that we can't be together in person, uh, but I'm pleased to be able to share some of what I've learned in the past year with you. So my name is Adam Berkowitz, and I work as a web developer at the University of Connecticut's Office of University Communications. Uh, before we begin, of course, as Eric said, please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A feature on the watch page, and I'll do my best to end with enough time for that. And you can find me on Slack as well. Today, I'm mostly going to share how I built uh, and learned to build custom extensions to the fantastic WP GraphQL plugin in a way that I think is both robust and maintainable. To start, I'd like I'd like to share some history and context for this application. You can reference the entire Git repo and the production application for the new version at the links on this slide. The Find a Provider application helps people find information about all kinds of doctors in the University of Connecticut Health Network. Nearly every doctor, including primary care doctors, specialists, and dentists, can be found through this application. From a user perspective, it allows people to search for these providers by last name, location, and or specialty. It then routes people to a list of results. And from there, they can see the attributes of individual providers and then request an appointment by filling out a form. As more and more features were requested though, it became significantly more difficult to maintain, update, and understand with the original technology. So I decided that it was time to rewrite the whole thing from scratch with newer technology and techniques. i had been curious about trying to view as a front-end framework, and I also wanted to try building something with GraphQL. So in the end, I used this project as an opportunity to experiment and learn. From a technical or developer perspective, this project originally made all its requests for data through the browser. Now, the application has been divided into two separate plugins, and one is a single page application. The other is a server side plugin, which lets us manage data in the form of GraphQL queries, and more on that in a moment. And this lets us proxy requests and take advantage of WordPress caching strategies. Both plugins get data about clinics, specialties, and doctors from a public read only REST API. By dividing the plugin responsibilities, I could research and then develop each independently. Plus, if we ever needed to change or replace one of the plugins, we could do so without tearing the entire project apart. So in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the server-side plugin and how I use an object-oriented approach to manage it. You'll also get an introduction to GraphQL if you're not already familiar with that. Right now, I'd like to make sure everyone understands what GraphQL is and what it's not. So let's start with what it's not. GraphQL is not the same thing as REST. WordPress has a REST API that many of you may be familiar with. It has a wide variety of endpoints that allow us to get information about pages, posts, authors, and so on. But personally, I have no earthly idea what data actually comes back from any of them. So for example, I can't tell you off the top of my head what data comes back if you make a request for posts. I can certainly go look at documentation and make guesses, and but those would just be guesses. I bet maybe the title, content, a link, and a slug are part of the data which we have access to, but after that I have no idea. It turns out that this is the set of data that comes back for each post in the request. And not only that, but all the data comes back, whether we want it or not. So what if we just want a few things as part of a blog index page? Do we really need the ping status or the GMT modified data as well? Do we really need to dig into metadata to find out the author's name? REST endpoints describe resources, and this pattern is true for every REST API, not just the WordPress API. That's because REST, a REST endpoints represent resources and not data. There is a resource for posts which matches up with data in the database. But the REST API doesn't make any assumptions about which parts of the data you want, it just provides all of it. GraphQL is different because it's a query language similar to SQL. With SQL, we have a model for getting specific information and only that information from a database. That's in part 
because it's a query language. It has tools and techniques to help us find and manage specific data. In a similar way with GraphQL, we can get specific information from a data source like a database or API. In fact, if you start at the bottom of this query and read toward the top, it will read in a way similar to a GraphQL query, just like this. So this query may look different from the previous one, but the purpose is the same. In both cases, you will get specific data and only that specific data for published posts. This can be extremely helpful for a variety of reasons. And one of the most important from a developer's perspective is that I know exactly what data I can expect when I write my application. That data is documented both in the request itself and in tools like the graphical application or GraphQL Playground. Another is that we can limit the total size of the request being made across a network. And lastly, all requests are made to the GraphQL endpoint and you can make associations between data types. WP GraphQL does a great job of making these kinds of requests available to us when we want to build projects. And in fact, it does this so well that it's being integrated into the next version of Gatsby's WordPress source plugin. But unfortunately for us, uh, there are enough hooks, filters, and methods to let us build extensions with WP GraphQL. Some people have turned these into integrations for other plugins, such as the Advanced Custom Fields plugin. But in our case, we needed to interact with a totally different API. And in order to do that, I wanted to understand at least a little bit about the parts of a GraphQL request. All GraphQL requests start with either a query to get data or a mutation to modify it. So all aspects of a CRUD app will apply to one of these two terms. If you want to read data, that's a query. Everything else, creation, updates, and deletions are all mutations. But after this point, honestly, I was confused. The terminology was getting in the way of my progress, and I had a hard time with what the terms represented or how they should be implemented. You might say, oh, you just need to go read the documentation, but I had done that, and in a practical sense, it hadn't helped me much. But once I committed to building an application that needed to get to production, I had quite a bit of incentive to figure it out. So I decided that as I built my plugin, I could use my confusion and the structure of the project to help me. By breaking each vocabulary word I was confused about into a directory, I could focus my attention more carefully. In this particular plugin, no mutations made it to pr production, and since all other GraphQL requests are queries, I didn't need those directories. As I worked, this approach also helped me make sure that no single file became too large or difficult to understand. So this is all certainly very nice but I still needed a way to ensure stability across the entire project. I needed to find a way to mimic the rigor of GraphQL. GraphQL is very strongly typed. It always enforces a contract between the server or GraphQL implementation and your request. Every implementation I've seen throws errors mercilessly if you don't conform to its expectations. And in honesty, that's a good thing, uh, depending on how those errors are described. As I thought about what I wanted, I reflected on the presentation on object-oriented WordPress plugin development Dash gave at last year's conference. Their presentation was helpful because I was able to consider some new approaches that I hadn't tried before. And I learned a lot by trying Laravel a bit and getting a handle on how that framework helps people organize projects. By thinking about how I might use object-oriented programming and PHP's native features, I was able to make good progress and meet my goals. I'll focus on GraphQL types for now since they're the first step in the sequence I showed earlier. I'll touch on the other parts as well after that, but as you'll see, the overall pattern repeats. You can use GraphQL with a wide variety of data, but until you tell the GraphQL client or server what the properties of that data will be, you're not going to get very far. These data will often be represented by an object or in PHP an associative array with properties. In my case, the data to represent included doctors. These doctors 
have a wide variety of attributes. Some are simple, like names or IDs, and other attributes like a doctor's education are more complex and needed to be created and connected to the provider type. With these ideas in mind, I started trying to build an object-oriented integration with WP GraphQL. To start with, every directory I have becomes a separate part of the namespace of the project. This way, I can keep the code organized. It also helps me narrow down errors while I build and debug. PHP will tell you when a class is outside your current namespace or it can't be found. This was a good start to matching my goals. Every file in the directory gets added to the namespace, which corresponds to the folder structure it's in. That way, I can keep track of files easily and avoid naming collisions. From there, I wanted to start creating an enforceable structure for each class I was building. Each type that I create will need certain methods. Primarily, a way to get the configuration of the type, for instance, that a name is represented by a string, and then register the type. Some might need special cases, like the ability to register a different kind of object type, but as I looked at the types I would need to represent, the majority would be very similar. Using an interface like this wasn't strictly necessary, but I felt like it was an extension of the goals I set out. It would keep me honest as I built out each successive class and helped me stay dry. Any class that uses or inherits this interface must use these methods. Not only that, but if they return something, they have to follow the type hints defined in the interface for the return value. In the case of the getConfig method, that means that all the methods that implement it must use the array type hint and must return an array. Otherwise, PHP will throw an error. The exact implementation for the methods, hap for the me methods is up to the class, but they have to exist. So let's see what that looks like. To expand on the interface, I made a parent custom type class. As you can see, the custom type class implements the methods from the interface. Since I want to define configurations for each type separately, the getConfig method will return an empty array here. This is fine since it satisfies the interface requirement. The register type method is where I call the WP GraphQL register GraphQL object type function as a closure. This will ultimately register the type. It takes two arguments, which are the type's name as a string and the configuration as an array, both of which are supplied by the class. As it stands now, I could create a new instance of this class with a type name in the constructor. Of course, it wouldn't do anything even if I called the register type method, but it also wouldn't break either, so far so stable. Now, since every class which inherits from the custom type class has these methods, I can keep the implementation for the child classes dry. None of them need to have a register type method unless there's a really good reason for it. Child classes will just focus on their configuration options they don't need to be concerned with actually doing anything else. Here's what that looks like. This is a sketch of the type used to define the properties of a doctor or dentist. Each child class will return an array with the information WP GraphQL needs. There are two primary keys in that array, description and fields. The field subarray will tell the server what kind of information to make available to requests. If the information isn't defined in this configuration, it won't be available via GraphQL, even if it's defined through the outside API. This can be very helpful if you need to handle secure data or have specific development requirements. Those cases can be managed by checking which environment you're in and modifying the fields accordingly. The configuration array also becomes a documentation displayed in applications like GraphQL Playground. Here's a little bit closer look at that array. Every aspect of the type gets defined here. Because GraphQL is strongly typed, you have to define a type for each property in advance. There are some other attributes you can set as well. For instance, you can make fields non-null, which means they're required, or you can define fields as a list. For instance, you might need to represent a list of strings for names. 
GraphQL understands a few basic types like strings, integers, and booleans, but as you can see from the education field, you can associate types between each other. In this case, the education type, which I defined and connected elsewhere in the application. Next, because I had close to 20 types, I needed to bring them together into a register. First, I'll show you the bad way I came up with, and then I'll show you the newer, slightly better way I'm trying for future projects and an eventual update to this one. In the current version, every type needs a separate function that I explicitly create. Inside this function, I create a new class instance and then immediately call the register type method. This works because WordPress can handle calling a public class method as part of an action. Ultimately, this approach does help keep my plugin.php file very small. After doing some administrative checks and requiring some files, the whole thing is only three lines long, one each for the register type, uh, the, the type reg, excuse me, the type register, fields register, and connections register. In this case, when I create a new type register in the plugin.php file, every method in it gets called when the, when the GraphQL register types action is run. But while it's good for my plugin.php file, this is a bad way to manage the actual class for a few reasons, mostly because it's not very dry. It relies on me typing out a bunch of use statements, type names, function calls, and so on. Also, if I need to add any other functionality to, the, functionality to this class, it's hard. Either I can't, or I need to modify the array filter in the constructor method. So all in all, this isn't my best work. But at the time, I was more focused on understanding the GraphQL part of the project than the PHP part, so it didn't bother me too much until it did. A few weeks ago, as I started thinking about this presentation, this approach just sort of felt terrible, so I started thinking about how to change it. The first and perhaps most useful thing I learned is that you can resolve classes from strings by assigning the string to a variable, as in this example. The actual class name, including the namespace, is stored as a variable. From there, you can create a new instance of the class and store that new instance as a variable as well. With that idea in mind, you can create a data file with an array of namespaces and class names to get the same result. You can also use any array methods you like to interact with the data. For instance, you can iterate over it to modify, filter, and manage it. What this led to was a different and possibly better approach to registering classes. If you'd like, you can see the boilerplate extension plugin I wrote at the link provided in the bottom right corner. In any case, now that I have a data file, the file can be read and included into the type register class. Dash helped me with the recursion to traverse the data file in other methods here. This approach lets me centrally manage the classes as variables. Since each variable represents a full class name, I can create a new instance of it and store it in a resolved variable. With a named callback function, you can't access or use additional arguments that aren't passed by the WordPress action itself. That's why an anonymous function is useful here. With PHP's use keyword, you can pass in additional arguments that aren't part of the original set. This approach let me pass through the resolved class and call its register type method as a closure. This greatly reduces the number of methods that need to be written for the class to work correctly. It also ensures that I can write other methods in the class and call them separately without needing to filter them out. In the context of the type classes, I just have to keep in mind that a register type method is needed for each one, but since this is enforced by the interface I showed before, that's not really an issue. As a small note, I really like the PHP methods that return new arrays, such as array map. These methods let me do things like return an array of all the available classes as a check for myself. And these also ensure that I can check the original array as well without being confused about how it's modified. At this point, all the project directories look more or less like the one for the types directory. 
There's a custom type interface file, which is implemented by a custom type parent class, which was extended by custom type child files, all of which are collected into a type register. And then the register can be created and managed in my plugin.php file. This worked out really well because I could structure each directory in a similar way. The fields directory looks like this, and the connections directory looks like this, and the resolvers directory looks like this as well. So I won't belabor the point of this strategy since all the other files look similar, but I at least want to touch on what the other parts of GraphQL look like and the relevant WP GraphQL methods to use. If you're following along on the shared slides, I've created some gist that you can look through at your convenience. Now, if you create a bunch of types and register them with WP GraphQL, and then go look in GraphQL Playground, you'll be pretty disappointed. There won't be anything in the documentation section. They'll only show up once you register a field with the register GraphQL field function. A field is a singular association to a query and resolves a singular instance of a type. For instance, a query that asks for one provider. You may often find yourself using query filters to each field, which you can see in the gist as well. In the case of the providers I needed, these were either their database ID or profile ID. But often we need data in a collection. To make that happen, we need to register a GraphQL connection. A connection represents multiple associations to a query and resolves a plural instance of a type. For instance, a query that asks for many providers. You can create arguments to filter the data here as well. Like SQL filters, uh, often these will use the keyword where. You'll see that keywords edges or nodes in GraphQL requests. These terms are conventions to represent collections of data. In this case, each node is a single provider. I think this is a good time to quickly review what we know so far. We start with a query or mutation, which will always be a GET or POST HTTP request. From there, we need to represent the data with types, fields, and connections. The last part of the sequence is the resolver, which manages, filters, and returns the data. If you have a chance to look at the gist I've linked to, you'll see how I implemented these in the context of WordPress and the WP GraphQL plugin in an object-oriented way. So this leaves the last part of the sequence, the resolver. This is where we're actually going to manage the information that comes back from our API and send data. And believe it or not, Resolvers were one of the hardest things for me to understand. You might not think so since it's a fancy way of saying a function, but there you have it. And as a musician, I just kept thinking about chord resolutions, and for some reason that didn't really seem to help. But here's what I came up with to help me understand a little better. A query or mutation is like tension. It's work that needs to be done. The resolver manages that tension for us, it might filter and manipulate the request until some resolution is reached. And that resolution is represented by the data which is returned. As soon as I understood that, uh, and understanding that I either needed to represent singular or plural sets of data, I came up with two methods I wanted to use for my project. Because naming things is hard, I decided to be as obvious as possible and call the two methods single node resolver and multiple nodes resolver. The single node resolver would only get used when resolving fields. The multiple nodes resolver would only get used when resolving connections. Again, if you're following along with the slides, you can look at the gist I made to demonstrate the resolvers more fully. This explains exactly what the arguments uh, which go into the resolver functions do. I abbreviated some of this method but it should give you an idea of how a resolver works. You can use the arguments that flow into it to perform checks and create filters. You can fetch, cache, and return data. Basically, anything that needs to happen outside the context of GraphQL happens here. In this case, I wanted to demonstrate how I might query doctors by last name. 
First, I check that the last name argument exists. Then I create a new provider connection, which is available through an SDK my colleague Brian Kelleher wrote. This SDK also makes caching available. From there, I apply the last name argument so it gets used as a query parameter when the API is called, and I can then fetch the providers. Last, following the GraphQL convention, I return the array of providers as a property of the key nodes. Much like types, fields and connections require configuration arrays with the WP GraphQL plugin. One of the keys in the configuration is tied to the resolver function. This is where we can create a new resolver class and use methods from it. But of course, things rarely go this smoothly in development. The WP GraphQL documentation does a nice job of explaining a few techniques for debugging GraphQL responses. The majority of the time, the mistake I'd made was in the configuration of the types, fields, or connections. These are pretty easy mistakes to make and usually just involve putting properties in the wrong arrays. But sometimes none of the techniques quite worked. For those problems, I fell back on something I knew I could rely on. HTTP requests. It turns out that you can literally copy and paste queries into an app like Postman. When you do this, you can easily add the humble var dump in your resolver. The dumped result will appear before the result of the query. And this can be a huge help. There were a few occasions where the only way it was happening was to dump various parts of the request as it was processed. For instance, when I had an issue with a request taking too long for WordPress and I had accidentally not handled the error well. At this point, you might very well be wondering, why bother with any of this? Why should I go to the trouble? Can't I just make a GET request to the REST API I already have, skip WP GraphQL and object orientation? Well, those are fair questions uh, because there are some downsides to using GraphQL. I think the most obvious downside is that now I have to maintain an extra plugin. You don't have to do this, but it was a way for me to focus my effort and ensure a sort of model view controller approach. We also incur some technical debt by using WP GraphQL. Now, strictly speaking, we don't have to use that at all. We'd need some other PHP GraphQL implementation, but it would be possible to swap it out. But WP GraphQL is a solid plugin in active development. So I think the time it saves outweighs the debt incurred. On the other hand, there are definite upsides. One of the biggest is the ability to create associations between data structures that weren't previously available. For instance, there's currently no REST endpoint for getting all the doctors who work at a particular clinic, but we could make that connection available in GraphQL. We could then get an appropriate list of doctors based on previously cached results. Another big upside is the ability to build a wide variety of applications around this model. If I need a Jamstack site built with Gatsby, for instance, or a plugin that acts as a single page application within a larger WordPress environment, such as the one that's currently running on our health network. Perhaps I need to do both and have them both make requests to the same GraphQL endpoint. So those are all choices within this model. As a developer, I'd also like to highlight one of the biggest upsides, which is the ease with which, at least with Apollo JS, you can switch between making a request through your server and making it through the browser. While I found some difficulties working with Apollo, overall the experience was great. It's a very well thought out framework that made developing the JavaScript front end much easier. One of the most useful things about it is how easy it is to switch making requests from server to browser. In fact, all you have to do is add one keyword. The Apollo GraphQL framework has the at client decorator for queries and mutations. When you use this decorator, Apollo understands that the request should be made through the browser instead of a server. As before, you can see the gist I created to demonstrate this process more fully. But in either case, the data returned by GraphQL will be exactly the same. Therefore, you don't need to change anything about the presentation or how your data is interpreted. 
Not only that, but if we wanted to get a list of all providers associated with a particular clinic, we could create that association as well uh, here through Apollo, uh, even though it doesn't exist within the current API. So as we wrap things up, I wanted to make sure you had some uh, resources available all in one place, and hopefully you'll be able to find these helpful. To sum up, WP GraphQL is an amazing plugin that you should check out if you have the chance. By using its API as a start and taking an object-oriented approach, I was able to more clearly and consistently understand, debug, and build a plugin for technology I had very little prior experience with. I'm excited to use the lessons I learned from these projects in the future. So please feel free to reach out to me by email or Twitter, which I check occasionally. Uh, I'd also be happy to work with people on extending these ideas and contributing to projects. And finally, I'd like to thank you and everyone here at WP Campus who helped uh, put this conference together. And thank you all for letting me present to you. All right, Adam, I'm pretty, it's pretty safe to assume that you have collectively blown all of our minds with your knowledge and expertise. So as we all recollect from being dazed and stunned on the floor, uh, I would just like to thank you for sharing both your experiences, uh, your breakdown of what is an incredibly complex topic to something that's consumable for us, and sharing your expertise. Uh, I greatly appreciate it, and I know our audience does as well. Uh, thanks, Eric, and thank you for helping with the rooms all of these past two days. It's really been amazing.